and I welcome all of you to our program, highlighting the ethical challenges for pediatric surgeons during the COVID-19 pandemic and beyond. We also wish to express our gratitude to our colleagues and all healthcare professionals for their selfless commitment to the care of patients under conditions unimaginable three months ago. The COVID-19 pandemic has irreversibly altered our reality and there will be no return to life as it was before this pandemic. It's imperative that medical providers take a leading role in forging a more inclusive, comprehensive and innovative healthcare systems to provide for the well-being of people globally. Intrinsic to this task is a thorough review of and reflection on the personal values and the moral foundations which bind us together as a humanistic society. How we think about ethical dilemmas in healthcare and the choices we make for our patients, our families, and ourselves will leave an indelible mark on the conduct of pediatric surgery in the months and years ahead. Our three panels will highlight key ethical challenges for surgeons. Please use the chat function on to send us your questions and comments. Our first panel begins with reflections regarding the ethics of a physician's duties and responsibilities to patient, family, coworkers, and self. My name is Kathy Hunter, and I will be leading the discussion on professional and personal ethical considerations for pediatric surgeons during the COVID-19 pandemic. Our goals are to provide a framework for understanding the ethical dilemmas encountered by pediatric surgeons during this time. I'm joined today by three pediatric surgeons from different practice models from a variety of geographical locations in the United States. Patrick, I would like to start by asking you about your role as a pediatric surgeon in one of the first places to be a hotspot for disease and how your feelings regarding your personal responsibility to your patients and community evolved over time. Well, Kathy, it was a very challenging time for our group here in Seattle. It was very early in the pandemic uh, here in our country. So we're talking sort of late February, early March, and definitely before widespread testing for COVID was available. And at the time, there was significant uncertainty, a lack of data, and there was fear where we had to worry about our own personal well-being and that of our families. Our group right away changed our whole call schedule to 12-hour shifts. Um, we took some senior members uh, in our group out of the call pool. Uh, we purchased the air seal device to limit spread through uh, peritoneal insufflation, um, and, and we started to medically manage our, our cases of appendicitis. But I think the hardest part was trying to figure out who we were making these decisions for. Uh, you know, normally uh, you have a patient and a family and you're, you're making decisions for them, the best thing for them. But in this case, there are so many other considerations. There is the best course for the patient, but also for the hospital, for the region. We had to consider our utilization of PPE and sort of the greater public health good. And in full honesty, we had to consider our own personal health and safety and, and that of our families and staff. So it was a big challenge. We had a lot of debate in our group. Dimitri, you work in the area that's been the worst hit in the US. You volunteered to be deployed to the adult ICU. Please, could you tell us some of your own motivating factors, including your personal concerns and expectations from your colleagues in your hospital system? So in New York, everything happened pretty quickly. I would say the week of March 16th, all the in-person clinics and non-emergency surgeries were canceled. So every inch of the hospital at Cornell, including the ORs and the PACUs, was turned into a COVID ICU. And at our peak, we had over 200 innovated COVID patients. So we got the email requesting volunteers for redeployment at the end of that first week. And as I considered it, I just realized that my division chief was high risk due to her age. And my other three partners all had spouses and kids at home. So I volunteered because I figured I was the lowest risk because I'm relatively young and healthy and I live alone. Uh, so my options were to either volunteer to help or to sit on my couch and listen to everyone in the city clap for me at 7 p.m. every night while feeling more and more guilty. Are there any factors that would have made you less willing to have been deployed? Yeah, it would have been different if I was older or if I had comorbidities or if I didn't live alone, such that you know volunteering would have meant putting someone else's life at risk. I also think it would have been different if I had to give up doing elective cases in order to volunteer. So I didn't view it as being too altruistic. Ronnie, you have two small children at home. Please, can you share your experience regarding your personal responsibility to your patients and to your family? 
when the COVID discussions first began in Los Angeles, we weren't fortunately very hard hit, but my really my first instinct Things was that I was very eager to and almost proud to jump in with my comrades to help with adult trauma, SICU, and ACS call at all of our level one trauma centers. But, you know, it actually took my husband saying, you know, hey, I'm worried about the health of our own family. And clinically, as the story unfolded, it, it really became apparent that our small pediatric surgery practice was going to be stretched quite thinly across all of the hospitals that we cover, each of them wanting some us to perform, you know, some other role. And then basically we decided that among the six of us, we had to have a minimum number and whoever was was going to be comfortable based on how they felt about their families and uh, and their young kids, whoever's going to be com- comfortable volunteering for those things, they could do it. As long as we had a, a minimum number of people, a critical minimum number of people that was going to really be caring for our the children that we were have a duty to, to care for. And Ronnie, you also provide patient care in the community. Can you comment on the impact of COVID on community hospitals? Yeah, they, we often cover community surgeons who are in private practice, and no doubt they've been hit financially by this. But more importantly for them, they're obviously they're worrying about their own families, but more importantly, they've got administrative people that they've hired that their their financial well-being, they're not just responsible for themselves, it's, it's all of the other people in their offices. And so I think that creates a little bit more of a difficult situation. Academically, we're a little bit protected and, I, and the private practice surgeons are not. So each of you has had a different personal and professional experience during this pandemic. I would like you to summarize what major ethical consideration or dilemma has been most significant to you during this time. I'll start with Patrick. I think the biggest ethical dilemma for us here was sort of how how to frame these clinical decisions. So, you know, usually you have a patient and a family and you're making decisions based on the best interests of, of the patient. And in this case, we weren't sure whose best interests we based our decisions on, uh, the, the patient, the hospital, the region. And probably for the first time for a lot of us, we had to consider our own best interests as human beings, as family members. If I were to get sick taking care of a patient, that puts my family at risk, myself at risk, our staff, my surgical partners. And and that was an unusual ethical consideration, I think, for all of us at the time. And Ronnie? Yeah, I think the biggest conflict for me was really between, on one side, my duty to the hospital and the community, and then on the other side, the duty to our pediatric patients, my own partners, and then my own family. I would say I'm very fortunate that LA wasn't hit as hard as New York, so we didn't have to make some of the decisions that people in living in New York had to make. And Dimitri? Uh, for me, you know, I guess it was mostly sort of personal safety versus obligation to the profession or the hospital or the city. Um, you know, I'd be lying if I said it wasn't scary the first time you walk into the ICU, but you know, I didn't feel that my own personal risk was very high, perhaps naively so. And then once you start working in the ICU and you see the nurses and the respiratory therapists and the junior residents who are the ones that are really you know, on the front line, uh, that gives you a lot more courage because you feel like if they can do what they're doing you know, all day, every day, then at least I felt like I didn't have as much of a reason to be scared. If COVID had actually, if the virus had actually affected children much more, then I think we would have had to make a choice just like you did, Dimitri, between your own sort of, you know, the, the health of you and the health of your family and then the pediatric patients. When we're talking about not being in crazy triage mode, that those two care of our patients and care of ourselves are sort of on one side and then the community and the, and the hospitals on the other. I think that when your the cases go up or, or the severity goes up, you're caught between like self-care and care of your patients, which I think is really where the, the ethical dilemmas lie. I would like to introduce the panel on triage and resource allocation. Thank you for the opportunity for our group to speak to you today about triage and resource allocation. First, Dr. Carlisle. Thanks, Bader. So to start, we have Ms. R. She's 36 weeks pregnant with a fetus with chaos or chronic high airway obstruction syndrome. Prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, the maternal fetal team had offered Ms. R delivery with an exit procedure and trial of therapy for the baby. But with the pandemic, the team is no longer willing to offer these interventions, setting poor prognosis and the resource intensive nature of her care. 
Ms. R asks, why should my baby not be given a chance so that the elderly can use the resources? The COVID pandemic highlights the challenges in assuring ethical allocation of scarce resources. The case I presented is a very specific example, but the difficulty in deciding how to allocate resources when there simply aren't enough has permeated every facet of healthcare. The first challenge is that in such a crisis, the goal of healthcare changes. No longer can the focus be on the good of an individual patient. Instead, the goal must shift to maximizing the health of the entire community. This isn't how we usually practice. This transition from clinical ethics to public health ethics is uncomfortable, and it requires a shift from standards of care to crisis standards of care. The COVID pandemic is not the first time that crisis standards of care have been discussed. The H1N1 pandemic, numerous natural disasters, recent mass shootings, and the like have prompted many states to develop crisis standards of care frameworks that have been heavily relied upon in efforts to adapt them to the current pandemic. These models are rooted in several ethical principles, distributive justice, the duty to care, the duty to steward resources, transparency, consistency, proportionality, and accountability. And inherent to each model is the recognition that in a crisis, the responsibility of decision-making ought to shift from the individual treating provider to a triage team. And this shift is a focused effort to enhance objectivity, minimize conflicts of interest, Additionally, it's an effort to reduce the moral distress of the treating physician. So the next question becomes, who should be on the triage team? Arguably, the team should include diverse perspectives and expertise, but it can't be so large as to impede prompt, decisive responses. It's generally suggested that triage teams include intensivists, physician and nursing leaders, lawyers, and ethicists. Some argue that community members should be a part of the team, Next, the questions become what values should the triage team prioritize? For some, the utilitarian principle of saving the most lives possible seems straightforward. For others, saving the most life years or prioritizing those who are most likely to survive and contribute to society seems appropriate. The work of Dr. Douglas White at the University of Pittsburgh has been especially interesting. Back in 2009, Dr. White published a pivotal paper in the Annals of Internal Medicine in which he argued that allocation strategies should prioritize the saving the most lives maximizing the number of life years saved, and prioritizing patients who have not yet had a chance to live through life stages. These ideas have evolved and are now published as a model hospital for allocating scarce critical resources on the University of Pittsburgh website. This model has provided a really nice framework for institutions developing their own allocation strategies, but it's definitely been a living document and has been revised in response to discussion. And it's been fascinating to follow these debates and as we've watched them, consistent themes have emerged. First, in Dr. White's models, the authors state their leading ethical goals. They recommend assuring access to care for all patients by omitting categorical exclusion criteria, like age over 70, thereby implying that there are no patients that aren't worthy of resources. And then they clearly state that the model does not deny care based on judgments of a person's worth, presumed quality of life, stereotypes, or disabilities. Assigning a medical priority is the next step. For adults, the SOFA or sequential organ failure assessment score is usually a pretty useful tool for the acute physiologic priority score. And while this model does not specifically address children, others like the PLOD or the Pediatric Logistic Organ Dysfunction Scoring System do exist. So after an initial score is determined, the triage team must account for comorbidities that may impact survival. The language around comorbidities is incredibly purposeful. The authors cite the utility of consideration of near-term as compared to long-term survival. And the rationale behind this very precise language is to avoid disadvantaging patients with decreased life expectancy from disabilities or diseases that are exacerbated by social inequalities. So as the authors put it, a patient with a five-year survival has the same priority as a patient with a 65-year survival. But after these initial calculations are made, the issues become even more nuanced. One important question is whether priority should be given to healthcare providers. The general argument in favor of this is that if such workers recover, they can return to work and serve the community. Some have also argued about gratitude or reciprocity for these workers, noting that they place themselves at a heightened risk of infection for the sake of the community, so they should be given priority. The challenge of determining what constitutes an essential worker is also notable and aligns with the difficulty in determining social utility. So while many models argue for prioritization of essential healthcare workers, this has sparked a lot of debate. 
Also interesting is whether younger patients, like infants and children, should be prioritized because they've had the least chance to live through life stages. Additionally, we must consider what to do when there's a tie in the priority scale. Random allocation by lottery is usually considered the fairest approach for using a first come first serve approach really seems to prioritize those with the resources to seek early evaluation and care. Next, communication with, of the decision with the patient and the surrogate is, is essential. And factors guiding the decision should be transparently conveyed by either the healthcare provider, the triage officer, or both, depending on the clinical situation. A real-time appeals process must be in place though, but many suggest that only appeals where the patients have a presumed miscalculation in assignment of their priority scale occurs. Rather, not an actual appeal about the overall structure of the framework. Finally, continued assessment by the triage team is absolutely essential. But what's really important is that implementation of the triage framework is really just where the conversation starts. Flexibility to modify the plan is absolutely essential as resources, patient demands, and our own understanding of the pandemic change. This is not a static process, and being overly rigid may certainly limit the nimbleness that's needed to respond appropriately. Messaging to the healthcare team, though, and patients and surrogates must be thoughtfully organized, though, so that this flexibility is not misconstrued as an inconsistency or lack of transparency. So back to the case we discussed at the onset of this section, I surely don't think there's an easy answer, but I'll encourage everyone to consider how they might rely on some of the principles we discussed to assess the priority score to this baby. Thank you. Thank you, Erica. Our next speaker will be Dr. Annie Fecto from the Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto. Thank you, Better. I'll be discussing the ethics of ramping up surgical care. As I finish a Zoom PPE stewardship committee meeting, my secretary emails me to please call, me, call back three families who are anxious to know when their canceled surgery will be rescheduled. All I can tell them is that we are developing a hospital prioritization framework that will help us determine a fair order for rescheduling their surgery. In time of resource constraint, we must be thoughtful and deliberate on the fairest way to reoperationalize more elective surgical care after the COVID pandemic shutdown. We must ensure that we allocate resources in a way that balances undue benefits and harms, protects the vulnerable and the disadvantaged, and ensures fairness in access to care. There must be equity and reciprocity. We can all agree that like cases must be treated alike, while dissimilar cases are treated based on morally relevant differences. There should be no arbitrary disadvantage to the marginalized population or advantages uh, based on social worth. There should be no discrimination based on social economic status, gender, age, or religion. Distributive justice is guided by many principles such as equal portion to all, portion according to need, effort, contribution, merit, or even free market exchange. These principles have led to multiple allocation systems that can come into conflicts at times, such as attending to the most immediate need versus helping the worst off, versus helping the patient is most likely to benefit, or deciding to maximize the health of a greater number of people in the population. So how do we decide how to clear the backlog of patients when we slowly ramp up surgical services? Most surgeons are quite adept at managing their practice so that most patients receive timely and appropriate care. It becomes a lot more challenging to maintain fairness and access to timely care when trying to ramp up the entire perioperative service. In my hospital, that means rescheduling 10,000 surgical hours to clear up the pre-COVID wait list, cases canceled during the shutdown, and new cases seen during the pandemic. We have learned during this pandemic that to uphold fairness, we must move away from surgeon centered distribution of OR resources to a more patient-centered approach. We must move away from prioritizing resources based on surgeon, surgical service, or who can work the system the best, and move towards prioritization based on patient's prognosis, progression of disease, and impact of waiting for care. Resource allocation must also be considered at the entire hospital level, integrating the need of surgical and medical patients. The regional context should also inform decision. The COVID pandemic adds new challenge to the distribution of OR resources, 
While deciding on the best way to ramp up surgical services, we must consider how the value choice we make tax the PPE and anesthetic drug availability, the supply chain stability, the COVID test resources, the workforce resources, and the ability to maintain social distancing both for families and medical personnel. The elected prioritization scheme must also be agile and fluid to respond quickly as the situation evolves. There is very little data to understand how the public would prefer us to prioritize delivery of care. This lack of clarity warrants us to ensure that the patient and the community have representation in, when prioritization is decided upon. The accountability for reasonableness is an ethical framework that can guide our decision makers to ensure fairness in prioritization during the ramp up of surgical services. There are five components to the, uh, to the framework. First, there must be relevance. Decisions should be made on the basis of evidence, principle, or argument that fair-minded people would argue are relevant under the circumstances. Second, there must be publicity. The process, the decisions, the rationale should be transparent and accessible to different stakeholders. Third, there must be an appeal process. There should be opportunity to re revise decision in the light of new evidence and a mechanism also to resolve dispute. Fourth is empowerment. All efforts should be made to minimize power differences and ensure effective stakeholder participation. Lastly, there should be enforcement. There's a need for a regulated process to ensure that all conditions are met. The pediatric necessary time-sensitive OR procedure prioritization score, also known as PMED, developed at the University of Chicago, seemed to be a very good example of a prioritization scheme that would fulfill all the conditions of the accountability for reasonableness framework. As presented in another APSA podcast, uh, this scoring system integrates three domains, procedures, disease, and patient, to help determine the resources needed for that patient and the likelihood of success. A low composite score implies a procedure with low risk and least resource utilization. This quantitative score also makes patient comparable across divisions. It also takes away the burden of decision-making away from the surgeon and any financial incentive for proceeding with a specific case. The institution's OR triage committee can then calibrate in an agile way uh, the threshold score to proceed with surgery depending on their social situation, their local situation, PPE supply and resource availability. In finishing, I would also like to mention the emerging literature on using the COVID crisis to reevaluate our current model of surgical care delivery and patients' access to care. Surgeons like David Urbach are urging us not to return to the status quo after the crisis, but use it as an opportunity to improve delivery of care. He proposes that surgeons should engage in a single entry model and a team-based approach where the patient care is delivered by the next available surgeon, both for the consult and the operation. The team-based approach favors standardization and reliability of care and decreases wait time variation while maintaining the patient experience. Patients are already accepting of this model in, as specialties such as anesthesia and obstetrics. Most women nowadays are not delivered by the obstetrician that's followed them during their entire pregnancy, but by the obstetrician on call that night. Another care model that's getting traction during this COVID crisis is single visit surgery, where patients are seen through telemedicine, the diagnosis is confirmed on the day of surgery, avoiding disruption of returns visit to the hospital by families. As Churchill said, never let a good crisis go to waste. Thank you for listening. Thank you. That concludes our presentation regarding triage and resource allocation. I'd like to introduce Dr. Bagwell from the Children's Hospital of Richmond and Virginia Commonwealth University to discuss essentials of coping and moral distress. Our panel from the Greater Ethics Committee was initially charged with a presentation discussing wellness to include topics of resiliency and burnout among pediatric surgeons. These are significant issues to be sure but have been dramatically altered in our present COVID era. 
when all of us have been forced to accept a world of burnout in our social as well as professional lives. The resultant moral distress and its attendant feelings of uncertainty and isolation may, however, provide new insights for reflection, even gratitude, all subjects to be addressed by members of our panel to follow. We're all familiar with the risks of burnout in our profession, and hopefully most of us have developed ways of avoiding it. For me, that has relied on finding great satisfaction in the meaning of my work and in my role as a father and a husband. And these are roles I have considered right and good. But one of the ways COVID-19 has affected all of us, it has restricted our ability to freely act in the manner that we perceive is right and good. This is the concept of moral distress. Most of our profession has seen our personal and professional lives dramatically changed, and we find ourselves in different spheres of moral distress. First, there are those of us in the front lines, directly caring for patients in the chaotic new world of COVID-19, perhaps working harder than before the pandemic, but in clinical situations that are foreign and, and frightening. Then there are those of us who have been forced to take a back seat, busy clinicians who are used to the daily gratification of helping people, who are now waiting, faced with the anguish of not being able to help. Both groups, while facing seemingly divergent stresses, are facing moral distress and are at risk for burnout. On the front line, we might face moral distress due to the inability to provide full care due to the lack of resources, the inability to reliably protect ourselves and our families while caring for patients, the insecurity of practicing outside of our usual scope of practice out of necessity, the anguish of separating families when they need to be together the most. In the back seat, we might face moral distress as we watch colleagues put themselves at risk while we shelter in place. We may want to volunteer for the front line, but know there will be a need for our services in our local community soon. We may find our delicate balance of being effective surgeons and parents and spouses is thrown off. For as now we work from home, and we find that we're not good at any part of our job. So these specific moral distressors that we face today are, are unique, but somehow they are unifying. Now let's hear from Mindy Statter about managing uncertainty. Thank you. This pandemic has generated existential fear. Fear has gone viral. We are susceptible to loss daily. The loss of safety, loss of physical connections, loss of jobs, loss of wealth, and loss of autonomy to move around the world. As surgeons, we are usually in control. Currently, we are faced with a loss of control and uncertainty. How can one best handle this? With self-compassion. Self-compassion is a construct of three components, mindfulness, self-kindness, and common humanity. Mindfulness, focus on what is in your control. Self-kindness, the importance of being supportive and kind to oneself. And common humanity, the recognition of our shared humanity. We are all in this together. We need to seek order rather than control. Maintain structure to your day. Maintain your rituals. The utility of, of a ritual calms anxiety and creates a sense of control. We are action-oriented as surgeons. We're defined by our work ethic and have a true sense of belonging at work. This pandemic has just disrupted that sense of purpose. And think of the reassurance you provided a parent during a telehealth visit. Remind yourself of your sense of purpose. Finding meaning in work cultivates resiliency. Resiliency is the capacity to live in a positive way, to bounce back despite stress and adversity. What distinguishes resilient individuals is the way they view the world, their framing lens. Their mindset is a growth mindset that aligns their personal values with work that shapes their actions. A growth mindset leads to optimistic ways of explaining adversity, which leads to perseverance. There will be post-pandemic growth. Viktor Frankl, psychiatrist and Holocaust survivor, quote, in times of crisis, people reach for meaning. Meaning is strength. Our survival may depend on seeking and finding it, end of quote. Jason Sikowski will now talk about isolation. Thanks, Mindy. In-person meetings with colleagues, dinners with friends, holidays with family, these fixtures of our lives that have kept us connected to our various social networks and our local communities are strikingly absent now. This involuntary isolation comes at a time when fear and uncertainty about current events makes us need our support systems even more than usual. A bad situation is made worse and the emotional and psychological toll is amplified. As this continues, our risk of burnout increases, our sense of moral distress is exacerbated, and our coping mechanisms are tested. <laughs> 
Vivette Murthy, the former Surgeon General, has been speaking out over the last several years about the growing body of evidence that shows the substantial negative effects isolation and loneliness have on the litany of medical outcomes, calling it a public health crisis and an epidemic. Social distancing worsens isolation, which increases the stress on our body, weakening our defenses, making us more susceptible to illness. Dr. Murthy argues that as evolutionarily social beings, meaningful connections with others are an important way out of the cycle. Although the ways we connect with others may have changed, perhaps in some ways permanently, it must not change whether or not we connect at all. Even coming together, albeit remotely, for a meeting like this reinforces and strengthens one of the many communities to which we belong. For us all, the key is to ensure that while we are social distancing, we don't allow ourselves to become socially distant. Now, Frank Margeron is going to say a few words about gratitude. Thank you, Jason. If we are to avoid burnout and find meaning in this time of global suffering and uncertainty, our perspective cannot be simply focused on loss, isolation, and confusion. Gratitude can be a powerful tool in reframing our outlook as we see how this pandemic in some ways has changed our world for the better. There's been a decreased focus on celebrity in the latest style with an increased appreciation for simple critical aspects of value. This includes a recognition of the importance of workers not normally praised like sanitation workers, food service employees, teachers, and hospital workers. There has been a common need for creativity as families are at home from work and school, whether this be through art projects or baking contests or backyard sports, this rare downtime has led to a deepening of core relationships at home. This creativity is also extended to finding new ways through technology to facilitate our work through online resident education, expanded patient communication, research, and professional collaborations. There's been a heightened awareness of the need for social connectedness. Events of significance such as birthdays, weddings, funerals, and graduations have had to change formats, but we have found ways and need to continue to find ways to express joy, whether this be through parades of cars with streamers, signs of encouragement put up in windows, or spontaneous dances on hospital wards when patients are discharged. There has been a restoration of the noble purpose of medicine and a purity in its application, a commitment to fight for the sick, to mobilize resources to areas of need, a respect for the dying, a longing to care for our patients held back from needed elective operations, a joined sense of joy for those who recover. There has been a heightened awareness of the importance of sound ethical guidance in resource allocation, end of life care, and timely communication with families. We need to have gratitude that what we do matters, that we still have the greatest job on earth to heal and protect the lives of children. Yes, this pandemic has changed us, but perhaps it's an opportunity to return us to what is truly important and bring us back to the fundamental reasons why we became pediatric surgeons in the first place. Thank you. And I'll turn it back to you, Charles. I would like to conclude with a verse from a poem which was part of a broadcast to the British nation on Christmas morning, 1939, by King George VI, as they faced the coming Nazi onslaught. I said to the man who stood at the gate of the year, give me a light that I may tread safely into the unknown. And he replied, go out into the darkness and put your hand into the hand of God. That shall be better to you than light and safer than a known way. So I went forth and finding the hand of God, trod lightly into the night. And he led me toward the hills and the breaking of day in the lone east. May it be so for each of us as well. And now, are there any questions or comments for any of the group? 